Um, I'm very pleased to welcome um, Kate, Dr. Kate Telcher uh, uh, today. Uh, I'm only sad that she could be here in person. I've, all, I've wanted Kate to visit me in Sussex and this seemed and this was to be that opportunity, but alas, we are all um, online and on Zoom. But nonetheless, uh, we hope to make this a very pleasurable experience uh, for all of us. Um, Kate describes herself as a writer, academic and researcher. Uh, she was of course reader in the School of Humanities um, at uh, Roehampton and is currently a researcher, a visiting researcher at Kew. She did a DPhil at Oxford and was one of the most uh, prolific and uh, brilliant historians um, I know. Her first book, India Inscribed on European and British writing in India between 1600 and 1800 is still one of the key texts which I use for students uh, when I teach empire and its images. Her second book, um, High Road to China, um, which, is, uh, which was on George uh, Bogle and the Panchen Lama and the first British expedition to Tibet was shortlisted for the James Tate Black Memorial Prize for biography. Uh, today, she is going to be speaking on her uh, third book, uh, which is the brilliant um, Palace of Palms, Tropical Dreams and the Making of Q, uh, which, is, um, uh, which is about the story of the creation of the Palm House uh, and uh, its uh, engineering feat, as well as uh, what it represented for the Victorians. Uh, so I welcome you uh, to deliver this talk, Kate. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Vanita. It's, it's a huge pleasure uh, to be here, albeit virtually. Um, and uh, I'm sure that some of you in the audience today will, will know much more about palms um, uh, from either a botanic point of view or, 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 or perhaps you know, a, a historical point of view. Um, we'll know about indigenous views of palms and uses of palms far more than I do. However, um, as Vinita says, you know, I'm a cultural historian and I'm looking today about at really at sort of the 19th century fascination with palms, what palms meant uh, in Victorian Britain. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be exploring some of the ideas um, that I, um, I trace uh, in, in my book, Palace of Palms, um, which is really a kind of narrative of the construction of the palm house and its display. Um, I'm interested in the palm house as a kind of lens uh, through which to view the early history of Kew and also to think about Victorian's real and imagined place in the world. So the Palm House was the first building to be commissioned when the Botanic Garden at Kew transferred from royal to public ownership in 1840. Sir so William Hooker, Kew's first director, who oversaw its construction, called it the glory of the gardens. And the Palm House has always been the grand focus and emblem of Kew. Uh, and I think this 1851 print really shows that. It's after a drawing by William Nesfield, who was the artist and landscape designer who laid out the gardens uh, and established these great avenues, these vistas that you can see stretching out at the back. One going um, to uh, uh, the pagoda, the Chinese pagoda by William Chambers, pagoda vista, one leading down to the Thames and beyond that to the Zion House on the other side, the Zion Vista, and a third leading off to a, um, a Grand Cedar, Cedar Vista. So this means that um, whenever you walk through the gardens, you're always catching sight of the Palm House. It's there right at the center. And indeed these days, the main gate to the gardens is, is just by uh, the, the Palm House. And, and so it's, it immediately um, greets you on entry uh, and, and there it is with its, uh, its, its ornamental parterres in front and its reflecting pond. Um, it really is the centerpiece and focus um, on cue. Okay. So 
When I started my research for this book, I really posed myself the question, why were palms accorded pride of place at Kew? And to address this, I set about uncovering the botanic, cultural and commercial significance of palms in 19th century Europe. And I, I wanted to examine the function of the great glass house. You know, why is it right there at the center? So today I'm going to outline some of my findings. And if you want any more, you can always go and read my book. So I'll start with the botanic status of palms. The Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus famously called palms the principes or princes of the vegetable kingdom. And that of course is the phrase that I've taken as uh, my title today. Transposing the ranks of human society to the plant world, Linnaeus placed palms right at the top of the hierarchy. They were accorded regal status because according to Linnaeus, palms were eminent for their prodigious height, beautiful for their unvaried simple perennial stem, crowned with an evergreen tuft of leaves and rich with the choicest treasures of fruit. And you'll see from the slide that I'm quoting there from the English translation of Linnaeus's uh, second volume, The Regnum Vegetabile, um, the English translation by Erasmus Darwin, who was of course the grandfather of Charles Darwin, uh, which goes by the rather splendid title of A System of Vegetables. Not only did palms occupy the prime position in the plant world, but they were closely associated with mankind the princes of the animal kingdom, according to Linnaeus. They were tributary to the primates or the first order of animals, and in particular to the prince, their cohabitant, and the prince is uh, humanity. This connection between palms and people runs through all the writing on palms in the period. And in addition, Linnaeus claimed that the region of palms was the cradle of civilization and that early humanity had lived entirely on the fruit of palms. Man dwells naturally within the tropics and lives on the fruits of the palm tree. Linnaeus contrasted the ease and abundance of tropical life with the rigors of the temperate region where humanity merely exists in other parts of the world and there makes shifts to feed on corn and flesh. Now, um, I'm taking um, that translation of Linnaeus from Alexander von Humboldt's personal narrative of travels to the equinoctial regions of the new continent. Humboldt, the eminent Prussian natural historian and geographer spent five years traveling in South America from 1799 to 1804. And he imagined that he had encountered people living in the primal state described by Linnaeus on the banks of the Orinoco. Like many European travelers in remote places, Humboldt conceived of his journey um, as a kind of voyage back in time. In those wild regions, Humboldt wrote, are we involuntarily reminded of the assertion of Linnaeus that the country of palm trees was the first abode of our species. The indigenous people depended for months of the year on the fruit of the peach palm, so named by Humboldt for the resemblance of the fruit to peaches. Uh, and there you see um, a, 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 a botanical print of, of, of the peach palm. Um, in the nutritious starchy fruits, Humboldt believed that he had found proof of Linnaeus's claim that humanity first subsisted entirely on palms. And indeed, um, Humboldt coined this rather wonderful word that you can see there in italics, uh, palmivorous, 
which is uh, like carnivorous, uh, only palms, um, and, and Parnivorous expresses this idea of, you know, complete dependence on palms. Following Humboldt to South America in 1817, um, the young Bavarian botanist Carl Friedrich Philipp von Marsius conducted a botanical survey of Brazil. Over two and a half years, Marsius collected so much plant material that he worked on little else for the rest of his life. Um, he published vast works on the flora of Brazil, but he reserved palms um, for separate treatment. The extraordinary Historia Naturalis Palmarum, which was published by Martius over the course of 30 years, was a uniquely lavish work three gorgeously illustrated atlas-sized volumes in Latin, devoted to all the known palms in, across the world. Um, the first volume, uh, which was produced in collaboration with two fellow botanists, offered a scientific introduction to the structure, form, geographical distribution, and fossilized remains of palms. The second and third volumes depicted the palms of the new and old worlds respectively. The size, the expense and the ambition of the project, not to mention a subscription list that reads like a roll call of the crowned heads of Europe, reinforced the regal status of palms uh, that had been established by Linnaeus. Now, unusually uh, for a botanic work, Marcius included landscape schemes uh, amongst the botanic plates. And as you can see from these examples, they're full of atmospheric detail. Here uh, with the plate on the left, you can see a hunter with bow and arrow um, shooting, aiming at a leopard. Uh, on the other side, you can see a, an alligator emerging from uh, the water. Um, they are, so they're, they're, they're really kind of engrossing, they, they pull you in. Um, and the dual scientific and aesthetic appeal of the volumes was first recognized by the poet and scientist Johann Wolf, Wolfgang von Goethe, who praised the botanic drawings and landscape plates for stimulating and satisfying our minds, imaginations and emotions. For Goethe, palms were at once objects of scientific fascination and creative fancy, allowing Europeans both to think and to dream. Uh, in fact, the idea of the Urpflanzer or primal plant, which was an archetype at once real and ideal, embodying all existing plant forms and patterns of development, that idea came to Goethe as he contemplated a, a Mediterranean fan palm in, in a botanic garden. So um, for Goethe, palms were kind of uh, the uh, plant, the original plant. Um, Marcius's volumes also included maps. Um, and this, uh, I, I got particularly interested in these maps. Um, these, this map uh, shows the worldwide distribution of palms. Uh, the more intense the red, the greater the numbers of palms. Um, and uh, Marcius identified a palm zone that encircled the globe between 35 degrees in the southern and 40 degrees in the northern hemisphere. And as you can see from these pages, uh, framing the maps are these incredibly exuberant engravings of palms. They're also fantastical creatures. Uh, they're sort of scenes of first encounter between Europeans uh, and indigenous peoples here and here. Um, and they, um, they kind of create a fanciful palm history of the world. And at the tops of these two, um, what you can see 
is a representation of a palm creation myth, which was invented by Martius. He imagined that palms were a product of a union between Mother Earth, Terra, and Phoebus, the sun god. You can see this in, in greater detail uh, on the next page. So Phoebus presides over the western corner of the old world, while Terra is seating, uh, seated on the eastern slope of the new world. Uh, she has one hand on the shoulder of a, a child river deity, um, and the other is presenting a palm. Um, and her, her, her normal emblem is actually, um, you know, the traditional symbol is flowers, but here she holds a palm. Um, so Marcia's idea that palms were the offspring of terror and Phoebus joined Linnaeus's Princes of the Vegetable Kingdom as one of the catchphrases of 19th century popular botany. And both epithets suggested that palms were the ultimate plant. Their distinctive form immediately distinguished palms from European trees. They exceeded all European norms in terms of the height and size of their leaves their generative organs and fruit. And more than any other family of plants, palms appeared to provide humans with every necessity of life, with food, drink, oil, clothing, building materials, weapons, tools, musical instruments, and books. The palm zone identified by Martius united regions that uh, we generally consider sort of discrete geocultural constructs. You've got tropical jungles, desert islands, the Orient. Um, I think these various locations are rather wonderfully captured in the vivid illustration of Sophie M Moody's 1864 biblical commentary on palms palm tree. Um, what Sophie Moody is doing in this book is really providing uh, a kind of illustrated uh, account of all palms that appear in the Bible and, and, and also kind of con contemporary uh, ideas of palms. Palms were a kind of literary and visual shorthand for the non-European and the exotic. When the painter wishes to represent a tropical land, the illustrated magazine of art observed in 1854, he depicts a landscape with palm trees. And of course, we can still have this tradition, this iconographic tradition of palms today. The bond between humanity and palms, which um, had been established by Linnaeus, was cemented by the mid 19th century emergence of the discipline of economic botany, the study of useful and commercial plants. Richly productive plant palms were celebrated as a source of boundless natural resources. So for instance, coconuts proverbially had as many uses as days in the year. Uh, and this uh, slide shows the frontispiece to Plants of other lands which are useful to man, 1843, and, and it is the coconut palm. As you can see, the, the captions, which you probably can't read, uh, are on the left hand side um, describe the illustration. So, you there you have obtaining the sap, then writing on palm leaf, drinking the milk of the coconut, coconut with and without the husk, and on the right hand, palm tree drum and boat, making coconut oil, baskets, etc., cetera, um, of palm leaves, and cups, etc., of coconut shell. And I think there in the bottom, you can see there's a, there's a hooker. Coconut oil was one of the most significant palm commodities in 19th century Britain. It increasingly replaced tallow in candle and soap manufacture. In 1840 in Ceylon, Sri Lanka nowadays, um, the 
colonial authorities enacted legislation which converted 90% of land into crown property. The Crown Lands Encroachment Ordinance encouraged the development of British-owned plantations for a number of tropical crops, including co coconut. And you can see here a, a 19th century print of a coconut plantation. To secure its supply of coconut oil, Britain's leading candle manufacturer, Price's Patent Candle Company, acquired a thousand acres of coconut plantation in Ceylon. Now, Price's owed its extraordinary uh, rise and expansion to another palm product, palm oil, which is extracted from the ripe fruit of the oil palm, which uh, grew wild in West and Central Africa. Between 1840 and 1854, the quantity of palm oil exported from West Africa to Britain more than doubled. Palm oil was not only used in soap and candle manufacture, but was also importantly a mechanical lubricant, particularly on the railways. And of course, the 1840s saw the huge expansion of the railway system. With increasing mechanization, um, the demand for palm oil rose sharply. And in fact, really, it's at this moment that we can date the origins of our modern dependence on palm oil. Um, so, so here we are at the kind of the 19th century moment that, that, the, that Europe first discovers the multiple uses of, of, of palm oil. Modern historians point out that uh, palm oil was produced in the Niger Delta by both villagers on their own account and by slave labor. Um, on the British side, the uh, palm oil trade was largely conducted by merchants from Liverpool who had formerly been involved in the slave trade. Now, despite the involvement of slave labor in its large scale production, palm oil was promoted in 1840s Britain as an anti-slavery product. The palm oil trade was suggested um, would displace the slave trade that persisted between West Africa, Cuba and Brazil. And here we have an advert for Price's palm oil candles. Um, the palm oil trade is here represented as a liberating force. So you've got um, figures of weeping, uh, kneeling enslaved peoples in the foreground. Um, this figure is a slave trader uh, with his wide brimmed hat. Oops, sorry. Um, but advancing here in the background um, are with our um, oil palm uh, traders with their calabashes of palm oil. Um, the figure in the middle is uh, a candle maker. Uh, uh, these boxes at the bottom are, are candle molds and he holds in his hand, oops, every time Sorry about that. He holds in his hand a candle. Uh, he's burning through the rope, the slave trader's rope. And at the same time, he's handing the cap of liberty, the Phrygian cap, uh, to the kneeling figure. So clearly this adver advert uh, is expressing uh, the idea that the palm oil is a liberating force. And at once, so at once eradicating an inhumane practice, oiling the wheels of the ever expanding railway system, spreading light and hygiene to the working classes, palm oil appeared to overflow with moral, social and commercial benefits. Now, of course, from our point of view, our vantage point, uh, the palm oil trade looks very different. Uh, in 1919, Price's Patent Candle Company 
um, was bought up by the Liverpool-based firm of Lever Brothers, which is um, today's Unilever. Uh, Lever Brothers ran forced labor palm oil plantations in the Belgian Congo with incredibly brutal regime. And of course, today, um, oil palm monoculture is a major cause of deforestation in Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, which threatens the habitat of endangered species and involves child and forced labor. So there's this very interesting history um, of, uh, of um, palm oil and, and, and forced labor, which keeps on repeating itself. So I hope I've um, set it up really to um, make the case that palms occupied a really distinctive place in 19th century European botany, culture and commerce. They epitomized the beauty and bounty of tropical nature and were closely allied to humanity. According to Charles Knight's The Land We Live In from 1847 to 50, um, Palms demonstrated the very perfection of organization, combining the highest imaginable beauty with the utmost imaginable utility. Beauty on the one hand, utility on the other. Now, the high status of palms um, combined with the expense of large palm uh, glass houses meant that palm cultivation in Europe was pursued only by the very wealthy. A palm house was the ultimate horticultural trophy. Grand glass houses were hugely costly to build, to stock, to heat, and to maintain. In the early decades of 19th century Britain, large glass houses were, uh, were the preserve of extremely rich aristocrats, like the Duke of Devonshire, whose great stove at Chatsworth is, is pictured here, or um, the large commercial nurseries uh, like Lodiges of Hackney. In Europe, by contrast, um, there were some government funded large glass houses. In 1838, the horticultural writer Charles Mackintosh uh, lamented Britain's lack of a public glass house. The government in this respect is much behind that of France, Austria or Prussia, he wrote. Uh, and a magnificent palm house functioned for Mackintosh as a symbol of an affluent advanced nation and Britain was in danger of losing out to its European rivals. No one can view the houses in the Jardin des Plans at Paris, he wrote, uh, these, these houses pictured on this slide, without regretting that we should be in this respect so much behind our less wealthy neighbors. Uh, uh, and the reason, of course, that Britain was more wealthy than its European neighbors was, of course, uh, imperial. And in 1840, the colonial magazine claimed that Britain had failed to take full botanic advantage of its empire. Truly heaven gave us chances such as no people possesses, the colonial magazine exclaimed but we have yet to learn how to use them. So given that national and imperial prestige was at, at stake, Sir William Hooker decided early in his tenure as the first director at Kew that the new public botanic garden needed a great glass house. The existing houses at Kew were poorly situated and far too small. The growing tips of the palms kind of kept on breaking through the glass. Um, and this was even when the, the, the roof of the old palm house had already been raised. To erect a grand palm house, freely open to all, 
was a bold assertion of Kew's new role as a national and imperial institution. And in an 1845 article, which was accompanied by this artist's impression of the Palm House, um, so, so drawn from the, uh, the plans, um, the Illustrated London News asserted, to put the public in possession of this noble family, that is the family of Palms, um, has been for the last 20 years the ambition of many governments and of many powers. But, it continued, the great attempt to rear the entire family in one vast establishment has been reserved for the English government. So here we have then, you know, the great uh, patriotic uh, claim for the, the, the Palm House at Kew. And the Palm House was indeed um, a hugely innovative iron and glass oops, a structure, really cutting edge technology. And it was celebrated um, also uh, as the frontispiece um, of Curtis's Botanical Magazine. This was the magazine that was edited by William Hooker for some four decades. Uh, and it, in fact, still exists today. It's the oldest and longest running uh, botanical periodical. Um, and in 1845, the same year that the Illustrated London News um, uh, had that print of the, the, the Palm House, here too, on the frontispiece of uh, Curtis's Botanical Magazine, we have another kind of artist's impression of the Palm House. Uh, and, um, it stayed as the frontispiece um, of the magazine uh, you know, for many years, but this, it appeared before it was even built, three years before it was even built. Uh, and I think that the fact that it appeared so early shows very clearly that Hooker had in mind that this was going to be the emblem of Q. So um, the Palm House really was kind of cutting edge engineering glass uh, and heating uh, in, 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 in technological terms. The design was largely the work of Richard Turner, a Dublin based iron founder and glass house manufacturer and self taught engineer in consultation with the London architect Decimus Burton. Now, in the, my book, I go into kind of great length of, to talk about the relationship between the two, these two figures, and the whole process of constructing the Palm House. Um, and I would, I'm just going to really summarize it here. Um, what was new about the Palm House was that Turner used deck iron, which was a newly patented form of wrought iron uh, for shipbuilding purposes. And Turner was you know, the first to grasp its structural potential. And to employ this new technology, Turner had to experiment with new manufacturing processes. He made a one-off machine to weld and curve the palm house ribs. And uh, the palm house was really one of the earliest, not the first, but one of the earliest prefabricated buildings. It was made up of thousands of components that were manufactured in Dublin, shipped to Kew and erected on site by an Irish workforce. Each component had a dual function, both to bear the structure and support the exterior shell. At the lower level, uh, the central portion consisted of a series of half arches of wrought iron. These half arches met 20 hollow cast iron columns, which cleverly doubled as drain pipes that supported the gallery and arched upper level. The columns were fixed to the gallery with cast iron brackets. You can see the brackets there, uh, with, which uh, evoked branching palm leaf stalks. And this a diagram um, accompanied a, a, a written description of the structure, uh, structure which appeared in the Builder magazine. 
and it was widely reprinted. Um, and I was somewhat surprised to find, you know, even in publications like the ladies newspaper, the ladies newspaper doesn't usually um, have lots of technical details about buildings, but for this one, you know, it included it. It was a significant structure. Um, the Palm House was glazed with a staggering 16,000 panes of curved sheet glass, which were made by uh, the great glass manufacturer, um, Chance Brothers in the Midlands. To counteract the problem of plants being scorched, glass houses at Kew had traditionally been glazed with green glass. But given the scale, expense, and prestige of the Palm House, um, William Hooker really wanted to make sure that um, the latest, most scientific kind of glass was going to be used. And the matter was referred to the chemist and photographer, Robert Hunt, who had researched the effects of light on plant growth. And to determine the precise shade of glass, Hunt conducted what to us might appear a somewhat bizarre series of experiments um, with the colored juices of the palms themselves and photographic paper. Um, and he ended up by recommending a sort of shade of pea green. And, and the diagram you can see there kind of records his findings about plant light, uh, light the effects of light and, and different colored glass. Um, and the Gardener's Chronicle of 1848 described the glass as the most delicate emerald green, colourless when viewed from inside, but when the sun struck from outside at a particular angle, the whole surface glowed like a mass of gigantic fiery opals. I rather love that description. Hooker had to make a strong case for the Palm House um, because public spending was strictly scrutinized during the 1840s, a decade known as the Hungry 40s, when Britain was hit by economic recession, bad harvests, and of course, the Great Famine in Ireland. Parliament only approved of the, for the, the funds for the Palm House in tranches first for the central section, and then once that was erected, the finance for the wings. And the Palm House attracted considerable adverse publicity over the course of its four year construction and the repeated requests to Parliament for extra funding. Much like directors of national institutions today, Hooker had to lobby hard to build a statement building which would draw the crowds and be a visitor attraction in itself. One image more than any other, I think, captures the scale and engineering feat of the Palm House. This is the wonderful daguerreotype. Uh, it's an early photograph um, by Antoine Claudet, taken in 1847 as, as the structure's nearing completion. Now, although the building is unfinished, you can see the grand sweep of the arches and the delicacy there of the, the spiral staircase, uh, just spiraling up. In the middle are two top hatted figures. Uh, they've never been fully identified. I think they are most likely Decimus Burton, the architect, and Richard. Turner. Um, during his lifetime and for over a century after, Turner's role in the design of the Palm House uh, was never fully acknowledged. The building was routinely attributed to Decimus Burton, the architect. Um, this is partly because Burton generally presented the design as his own and partly, I think, for colonial and class reasons. Burton's status as a well-connected English architect quite eclipsed that of Turner, an Irish tradesman. The Palm House was populated 
um, both with Hughes' existing plant collection and new donations. Hughes' palms had outgrown their old glass house and, uh, and that the old uh, house had to be partially dismantled to get them out. Uh, then using cranes, which were hired from Deptford Dockyard, um, the immense palms were lifted from their beds, hoisted onto rolling platforms and trundled half a mile to their new home in the palm house. Some palms were donated by wealthy landowners like Sir George Staunton uh, in Ley Park at Hampshire, who'd made his fortune uh, at Canton, he was in the East India Company. Um, he plowed his money into his estate um, uh, in Hampshire and he uh, donated uh, a great Brazilian liqueurie palm which had outgrown his own conservatory. It was packed up in a specially constructed wooden box, uh, uh, 42 feet long and sent by train to Kew. But by far the largest donor of plants to the palm house was the Calcutta Botanic Garden. Over the course of 10 years, Nathaniel Wallach, the superintendent, sent to Kew some 500 plants of the rarest and most valuable description. And with its collection gathered from around the globe and these contributions from many colonial botanic gardens, the Palm House really demonstrated the wide reach of Britain's imperial power. And I think a lot of its potency really um, is because uh, the Palm House really offered the chance to engage in tropical fantasy. When you go into the palm house, um, you're immediately struck, your body is immediately struck by the heat. Um, and it's a really visceral experience. And I think, um, I think the first visitors um, to the palm house at Kew um, really experienced this. Uh, it was a place, a fantasy, a place of the colonial imagination. It is the heat of India, the London Journal of 1861 declared. And there you are, within the distance of an hour's walk from London, without trouble or expense, amid the vegetable glories of the tropics. Such regal forms bathing their green crowns in that atmosphere of warmth and light. Such coronets of plumes upborne to an astonishing altitude. I think you can clearly see there the Linnaean trope of princely palms at work. And palms were the undisputed stars of the Palm House show, although there were many other plants in the Palm House. There were tree ferns, cycads, bananas, and flowering creepers which trained up the ironwork. Uh, which was painted a, a deep shade of green, not like the white of today, it was green. It really reinforces the kind of the jungle effect. And the Quarterly Review of 1851 imagined tropical dangers lurking in the undergrowth. A tiger might start out from among those tree ferns. A boa constrictor might be climbing the trunk of that coconut palm. A viewing gallery ran around the whole structure uh, and you initially gained access to this one spiral staircase. Uh, you can see the gallery uh, in the splendid full page illustration from the Illustrated London News. Um, you can see that uh, from the detail in particular that they're visited, visitors looking down from that vantage point in the gallery. Now, in his final work, Cosmos, Alexander von Humboldt celebrated hothouses for their ability to ignite the imagination. He wrote, when we look down from the high gallery, on the luxuriant reed and tree-like palms below, we feel for a moment 
in a state of complete delusion as to the locality to which we are transported. And we may even believe ourselves to be actually in a tropical climate, looking from the summit of a hill on a small grove of palms. And guidebooks suggested that the gallery was the spot for a moment of Humboldtian transport and rapture. I mean, they all told you to go up to the gallery and there look down on the view and you will be amazed. Um, the journalist James Hanny wrote in Household Words in 1851, I climbed with a sensation like swimming in herbage, wonderful phrase. Uh, he went, looking out from the gallery was like being perched above the forest. The palms were slowly swaying and the feathery tops of the tall bamboos fluttered. The heat and colored light still the fancy into a dreamy mist. So there you have Hannes suggesting that the palm house visitor kind of drifts off into this tropical reverie. So the grand tropical illusion of the palm house concealed its workings from view. Located in the basement of the palm house were 12 boilers connected to a network of underground, uh, underfloor hot water pipes that looped their way for around for, for a distance of four miles. There was uh, an underground railway in a tunnel which linked the boilers to the coal yard, allowing unseen workers who are laboring in sweltering and in fact very often flooded conditions uh, to push coke wagons along the track to supply the boilers. And there you have uh, a, um, a sketch of the tunnel and the work of his coals. Um, from uh, one of um, Turner's um, documents. Um, the smoke um, from the boilers uh, returned along this same tunnel. I think you can there see the, the tubes um, along which it's, it, it's traveling um, to be discharged from a chimney from the Campanile, the Italianate bell tower that you can see here as well. Uh, that's located at some distance. So the chimney is nowhere near the, the grand glass house. It's got to be separated. Um, you don't want to see any of the smoke belching out. And at the top of the tower, there's a pressure tank um, which powered a sprinkler system in the palm house um, that's supposed to dispense showers of artificial rain. Uh, never worked terribly well, but that was the idea. The Palm House was really a grand experiment in, in creating an artificial environment. The Palm House was a great visitor attraction. I want to uh, you know, start to wind up my talk today with this charming 19th century print, which, well, it misleadingly uh, kind of compresses all the landmarks of Kew into a single view. It's, it's quite an impossible uh, a view, but um, what I think it does is it presents the gardens as this great kind of architectural spectacle and visitor attraction. And you can see in the crowds, you can see there's a, a lady artist, you can see some, oops, grenadier, grenadier guards. You can see also, I think, some Ottoman visitors there with, with feathers and robes. Um, Visitor numbers to queue more than doubled um, with the opening of the Palm House in 1848. And Palm House notably predated um, the Crystal Palace designed by Joseph Paxton uh, for the Great ex ex Exhibition in 1851. Uh, the Great Exhibition um, also attracted huge numbers of visitors to London in general and to Kew in, in, in particular, and visitor numbers to Kew again uh, more than doubled in 1851. I mean, in fact, so great were the numbers of visitors to Kew that they um, that Hooker ordered for a second spiral staircase to be added to, to get up to the gallery in the Palm House. Like Paxton's exhibition building, the Palm House was now also described as a palace. 
hence the title of my book, Palace of Palms. Um, rather than exhibiting masterpieces of manufacturing, the palm has displayed the marvels of nature. It is a crystal palace, pronounced summer day's recreation. A great glass house filled with nature's wonders collected from various parts of the world. And just as the great exhibition was claimed as a defining moment of the era, so too was the palm house. There could be no greater testimony to Britain's technological prowess and imperial reach than the Palace of Palms. We live in a wonderful age, proclaimed the illustrated London Almanac for 1853, when these gigantic children of the sun, the palms, these gigantic children of the sun can be induced to live and flourish amongst us. The palm house remains a major visitor attraction today. The current emphasis of the display falls on ideas of biodiversity and conservation. Hugh, in its recently released corporate strategy, commits itself in the upcoming decade to undertake a major revisioning of our iconic glass house, the palm house, to engage new generations of plant lovers with conservation. It goes on to say, we will create a verdant tropical rainforest to explain how these extraordinarily diverse and important ecosystems regulate the global climate for all of humanity and why they merit immediate protection. Now, this aim is, of course, hugely important. But also, as I hope I've shown today, the history of the palm house itself could be productive, productively reinterpreted. The building and its collection offer, I think, an unrivaled opportunity for another of Q's stated priorities. Uh, and, and that is one which Vanita, amongst many of you today, knows a lot about. And that is you know, the re-examination of its colonial past. And I'll end there and I will stop screen sharing. Wow, thank you, Kate. That's um, absolutely amazing, very cogently and beautifully presented, almost literary. And I'm not surprised because you come from an English background, a background in English literature. I mean, could I invite people to use the chat to ask questions immediately? Um, and uh, just, 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 just while people are gathering their thoughts, just to say, you know, um, you you didn't mention David Arnold and this sort of uh, take on this whole um, uh, issue of, in the, you know, how much the tropics were invented as much as they were encountered. Uh, and uh, in some senses, um, this invention laid it open to colonial appropriation. But towards the end of your talk, you seem to suggest that the palm house itself was about inventing or, or was about mastering nature in a very similar sort of way. And it was about the empire's sort of global reach. And I wondered whether you agreed with him or whether you disagreed with, um, uh, with Arnold's overall thesis. No, no, I, I, I certainly build on, on Arnold's work and, and, I, and I, I, I didn't mention, I didn't mention my many influences, um, uh, not least uh, Jim Endersby, who's in the audience today. Um, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't mention those uh, today. But yes, of course, uh, David Arnold's ideas of, of, of tropicality are, 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 are something that I am building on here. I suppose I see the palm has itself as a, a rather wonderful kind of uh, in, encapsulation of these ideas and, 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 and a, a kind of a place that, you know, 19th century Londoners visited and that, you know, and that we can still visit and, and, and also reenact our own 
tropical fantasies. And I, and I do think it's worth thinking about the function of, of palm houses, hot houses um, in, in that regard. Um, I mean, I also note that I mean, the, a book that I couldn't take into account because it hadn't been published yet, but uh, Etienne Benson's recently published um, Surroundings. He notes that um, uh, he dates back the I European idea of the environment, the idea of the environment to sort of 1790s France and and really thinks of hot houses as the place that um, the idea of the environment was actually born. So the when you can create an artificial environment is when you start to think about those various conditions, um, how you create an environment. And, and clearly the palm house is doing that work uh, as well. And, and I think, you know, um, it's part, you know, it really is a, a, for me, a, a, such a kind of imperial symbol, the way that it is you know, located at the center of physically in the gardens with all those grand avenues leading the straight out, those, those vistas, those panoramas, it's, it, it really is commanding the view. You know, one of them going to a, a Chinese um, pagoda um, one of them, uh, you know, re reaching across to, to Zahn House, where there, there are also actually, you know, another grand glass house uh, there. Um, there's a sense of commanding the landscape. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, um, in this, a similar way, perhaps, as Kew is at kind of the apex of the colonial botanic gardens around the world, you know, the way that it transferring all the plant products across the world. It just seems to me to somehow encapsulate all of that. And, and that's why I think it was adopted as um, you know, a symbol by Q, Q early on, and it continued to be used that, you know, in my book, I show sort of uh, um, images of it being used you know, in, in un unusual ways. And the, the chemist and druggist magazine has it as a kind of summer image for a summer edition, you know, the palm houses as this great imperial structure. So I, I think it's important um, to acknowledge that. And, and also it's grandeur, it is palatial. Thank you, I can see that Jim has his hand raised. Um, Jim? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Benita, and thank you, Kate. Lovely talk. And uh, as I said in the chat, I love the book. I, you know, I think of myself as somebody who knows quite a lot about Q, but I learned so much from it. It was just a, a wonderful read. I wanted to ask you, and this follows actually rather nicely from what Benita just asked, about the luxuriousness of palms and uh, the little bit that you read of the reviewer imagining drifting off into a kind of tropical reverie in the palm house. Of course, as we all know, one of the, the kind of tropes of European racism is that uh, the cold makes you smart. So nor hardy northerners, Nordic types and so on, are more advanced, more civilized because they've had to battle the elements. And the reason that tropical regions are considered primitive and backward is because life is too easy. Do you find that kind of association between palm trees and laziness and backwardness uh, in your writing? And do the palms in that sense ever represent a kind of threat of uh, an image of, of you know, People, you know, white people going native and, and reverting to more primitive types if they go to the, spend too much time in the tropics. Yes, well, you, you're, you're of course quite right that 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 palms, you know, are you know immensely productive, enormously productive. Um, they can they give you everything you possibly need, so you do not have to labour. I mean, there you, you have it even in Linnaeus, you know. That, that mankind makes shifts to to live in in temperate climates. You know, has to has to grow corn, has to has to hunt. Um, so yes, life is easy, luxurious, um, indolent. Yes, I mean it sh certainly shades into all of that. And uh, yes, of course, um, there is both kind of the attraction of that and possibly the 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 uh, alarming threat of going native of that in in in, in the writings um yes it is it is it is entertained as a, a fantasy 
of, of indolent ease. I mean, um, in my book, I, 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 I talk about uh, Tennyson uh, and, and the way that he quite often in his poems imagines kind of life under palm trees uh, and luxuriating under there and then has to sort of dismiss it push it away and I think that's kind of a sign of that anxiety no no we have to march forward in progress we are we are the kind of uh, uh we, we're not allowed to lounge indolently much as we might like to other questions please feel free to keep them coming just just to say that I come from a part of the world where uh, Kerala um, and my own community was very much into um, uh, climbing the, you know, the coconut palm to harvest toddy, you know, so we were the toddy tappers of Kerala. So there's this whole culture of palm, which I know about from my own sort of historical family background. But just as, just as I, you know, the way in which you talk about uh, this palm zone, uh, it, it also appears to me that there's, um, you know, when you look at the work of um, uh, the European, uh, Bernard Smith, the European vision of the South Pacific, where he talks about the exotic, and you, you've said this as well, the replacing of the olive tree and a lot of the picturesque paintings with the palm tree. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea of the picturesque comes from that tradition as well of, of the palm. I think that, that again is very, very fascinating. If you explore it in art, as you said, which you've done briefly with Sophie. Yes, movie, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you certainly can. Um, and um, yes, toddy tappers. Um, you know, one of the one of the things I didn't have time to touch on here was, of course, um, the kind of companion building um, uh, to the Palm House at Kew, which is the Museum of Economic Botany, which is put up also put up by William Hooker, uh, and there. Um, uh, uh, the economic um, potential of plants is, is on display. Um, palms are feature very heavily um, in, in the museum. And the reason that I connected to Tovadi Tappers is one of the things that I discovered in one of the guides to the uh, 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 economic botany collection in the museum was a um, kind of a model of Toddy Tappers. Um, um, oh, really? Um, and I wanted to find it. I don't think it still exists. I really would have loved to find it. Um, but there were, there certainly, there are plates um, of, uh, there are lots of engravings of toddy tappers and, you know, fascination of how they get up there and, you know, how they use loops and, and how they climb and all of that and the whole process. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 um, I, I will, I would love to find the, the toddy tapping model. Um, <laughs> well, I can go on, on the lookout for you, you know, in, in Calcutta. <laughs> yes, um, there is um, there's a wonderful uh, indigo uh, factory model that Caroline Cornish has written uh, very interestingly about. Um, uh, it, it, that, that was in the uh, Museum of Economic Botany. Yeah. Um, but, but also, yes, toddy tapping. Um, so Sophie Moody, who's a uh, very sort of vivid uh, illustrations I showed yeah. the talk today. So the community talks a lot about kind of uh, the, the, the um, moral uses of the palm and the kind of, and it's a symbol. And, and she certainly disapproves of toddy tapping and alcohol and the ways, and she talks about the ways that the palms that have been tapped, they're, they're no longer straight and upright, but and she's saying they're growing crooked. <laughs> Where, they, where they've been tapped and you know so uh, it's uh oh, really? <laughs> moral degeneracy because they have straight upright <laughs> uh, about the upright christian uh as opposed to the, the, the so there's a lot of moralizing about that there's a lot of um theology that can be read into palms i mean you know what i didn't have time to talk about um was of course the whole kind of biblical symbolism of palms you know we just Christians have just celebrated Palm Sunday when yeah. palms are, 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 are kind of paraded as, uh, as uh, you know, a symbol of kind of triumph and, uh, uh, you know, and resurrection. And, and there's a whole biblical yeah. commentary that we 
could go into, but probably don't have time to. There's a there's a hand raised from William Baharol, the Linnean Society. Yes. Hello, Kate. Can you hear me all right? Thank you. Yes, I can. Uh, thank you. That was a, a wonderful talk. I wanted to ask about um, uh, Carl Linnaeus, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, I was trying to think about other references to palms in his works, and I was reminded that there's a passing reference, strangely, in his uh, description of the phoenix in his Paradoxa section in the Systema Naturae, mm -hmm. um, where he talks um, a, a little bit about various mythical creatures, and he says rather uh, sort of cryptically at the end, verily this bird is a palm, and he cites Kempfer, um, and it's a, a most uh, enigmatic reference. Um, clearly there's an, a, an etymological link between the two in, in Greek, but did you, in the course of your research, come across a lot of sort of references to the phoenix, perhaps in sort of po uh, poetic or sort of metaphorical senses? Um, it, and do you have any sense of what's going on there? Because it's, it's that, just... That, that, that's the, the name, isn't it, this, um, for the date palm? Hmm. botanical name uh, it, it, it link, linking that um the palm i think i think maybe what's going on there is is the palm is also used as a sort of symbol of, of of resurrection as well i mean i was talking about the biblical significance so i think there the phoenix being reborn palms are symbols of the resurrection you know the the, the, the blessed as they enter heaven are all carrying palms, you know, that kind of thing. I think maybe that's the link. Um, but yeah, it is interesting. And, uh, you know, once you start seeing palms, you do see them everywhere. So looking for them, you know, they will be everywhere. And you may be, you know, Phoenix is too. It's that kind of symbolic link and connection. You, you do start to see them everywhere. But yeah, worth pursuing. Thank you. Great question, yeah. Any other questions? Right, okay, no, I just, I mean, I could ask another couple, but I just wanted if, you know, I mean, just, just taking, you know, we still have a couple of minutes. It's so fascinating, just the, the fact that you talk about all these great, these big country houses growing palms. I mean, there, that also was fascinating, this transfer of palms from the great country houses. 2Q in 1848. How, how, how much was it cultivated quite widely in, in Britain before? Well, I mean, what I was showing you, uh, I showed you also uh, the stove at Chatsworth, the great stove at Chatsworth, and that really was, uh, the Duke of Devonshire really was the, uh, the most uh, extravagant of uh, landowners and gardeners. And he, of course, employed Paxton, Joseph Paxton, um, who designed the great stove. Um, and it also uh, Decimus Burton, who's the architect on the Palm House. And Decimus Burton sort of signs off on, um, on the designs, uh, uh, or really on the building uh, at quite a late date of the great stove. Um, but yes, so, it, so the great stove was, um, had many climates in it, and it, it was it was it was different from um, the palm house because it was also landscaped, um, and 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 uh, and you know um, and it was recreating all sorts of different zones, uh, and that was you know a huge aristocratic um, display, and I think one of the things uh, initially. Um, it, it might have been, you know, it was used as the model for the, the Q glass house. Um, but as soon as uh, it became apparent to William Hooker that, you know, he had government backing for his own designs and things, you know, he's, they, they did their own new design, but it, it was initially a model. Uh, and it was, you know, hugely extravagant. I think um, Chatsworth had um, uh, purchased palms from uh, a, a, another aristocrat. They were called the Tankerville Palms. Yeah. And they were transported at huge expense by 
I think wagon. <laughs> um, can you imagine seeing these palms, you know, um, transport, yeah, amazing. Being, being transported? Um, uh, 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 and I think that was reported in the press, the, 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 the slow progress of the Tankerville palms um, to, to be installed in, in, in Derbyshire in, um, in the palm house. So yes, um, really expensive, ostentatious um, for aristocrats and, and you know, burning hu up huge amounts of money, quite literally burning it up to heat it. So the, the first half of your talk was just amazingly on the, the this, this tropicality, the whole idea. The second half was on Victorian engineering. And there are a lot of questions here that I don't know whether people want to ask around that. I mean, I mean, I found it gobsmacking that they, they, they managed to create this artificial landscape in a way in which it, uh, which um, USA was unrivaled even in Europe, wasn't it? Well, that's what they were claiming. I mean, there's, yeah. a, lot of, you know, it's, there's a lot of claiming going on and, you know, in the guidebooks um, and in the press. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of kind of, I guess, puffery, but there is also, I think, you know, um, you know, it was an extraordinary building. It was, it was much more spectacular as a display than the um, the, the the hot houses at the Jardin des Plantes, um, which weren't that hot for starters. Uh, and also, um, when Joseph Hooker went to see them, um, he reported back that they were all covered with soot and the glass the glass was all dirty. Um, that the, 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 uh, they, they had a very large collection of um, exotic plants that they, they weren't really flourishing. So, but then again, of course, Joseph Hooker would have been <laughs> biased as well in his opinion. But, but, you know, there is a sense that this was, of course, you know, a grand statement building. And I think one of, um, one of the ways we can read its significance is the fact that, of course, it was also the model for other glass houses all over Europe and the colonial world. So that, you know, throughout the 19th century, um, the palm house at Kew was used for, as a model for glass houses in um, places like Copenhagen, Brussels, Adelaide, um, Vienna, San Francisco, New York. You know, it really is I think it establishes the idea of the palm house or the great glass house as you know as the center of a botanic garden and what a botanic garden needs and and I I think um, we to some extent still have that idea today you think of the Eden project and the, the biospheres well they're not made of glass but they are you know an artificial environment in in in, in, in Wales you you've got the 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 national Gar uh, botanic gardens in Wales with the great Norman Foster great glass house you know they are the it's the idea of um, you know creating um, I guess a kind of an environment in miniature, world in miniature. We still love that, don't yeah, we? We still yeah. love the idea of being transported. Two immediate questions, if nobody else wants to ask, and then we can wrap it up. Is just, just what did it, did it, did um, Burton affect uh, Paxton at all? What, did was the Crystal what? Palace sort of effect? It did it was it modelled a little bit on this or? Well, so, oh well, so well, I mean, there's you've got you've got. Burton, uh, uh, Decimus Burton, the architect, and, 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 and had worked with Paxton before. Oh, yeah. We're talking about Turner. I mean, what I... I, I, I oh, Turner. Um, so yeah. Turner is the engineer, and, this, and the Palm House really is an, an engineering structure more than an architectural structure. And Turner actually um, wanted... You know, Turner's hugely uh, ambitious. Uh, and goes after every every big contract going um, with varying degrees of success. And he really, really wanted the great exhibition project building himself. And he submitted not one, but actually two designs for it. And he, he was a kind of runner up. He was very embittered that he didn't get land that project. Uh, and um, he, um, when he was um, elect, uh, entered, uh, elected to, the uh, Institute of Civil Engineers. He spent his his first kind of 
uh, addressed to the, uh, the uh, association, the gathering, um, laying into the Crystal Palace and everything that was wrong with its design and how <laughs> he would have done it much better. Why didn't they choose his, <laughs> more or less? Um, but also saying, you know, it was, you know, the way it was designed, it was a great fire hazard. Now that ultimately did prove to be true because of course, Crystal Palace structure, it was, it was after the Great Exhibition, it was moved to Sydenham, it was re-erected, it was enlarged, but ultimately it did burn down. So I suppose in the end, Richard Turner was vindicated. <laughs> Very interesting, wow. And the last question is about the workers. And then I've, I completely have, you know, about, you know, you had the tunnel image of that poor yeah. worker. Yeah, yeah. So how much the, the sort of energy consumption and that image of the poor worker shoveling coal, was was that all day? Well, yeah. The, so I mean, it's so, incredible you know, thing. One of the things, yes, one of the things that I took out, you know, and I'm interested in explore at greater length in the book is, is the whole labor involved in yeah. this extraordinary display and the expense. And, uh, so one of the figures that I, I look at in particular is John Smith, who is the curator um, of the gardens and, and whose responsibility uh, the Palm House um, is. Now, John Smith is a really uh, interesting, engaging, grumpy figure. Uh, he, he's, it, it's his job. To, to keep this all going. And he always warned Hooker and the architect that the Palm House was in the wrong place. It was situated in the wrong place. It was on the site of a former lake and it was going to be liable to flooding. Uh, and he was proved right. Um, the, all those basement areas regularly flooded and it was his right. job to pump get the water out of it to pump the water out so not only was it really hot with those 12 basement boilers but it was also wet they had to have these fire engine pumps down there pumping them out uh, continuously and and so the, the workers were um involved not only in sort of stoking the boilers and uh but also bailing it out um so it was very heavy hard labor uh, and, and of course, um, you know, it was all concealed from view. I mean, even the kind of the ventilation shafts were sort of hidden in flower beds, that kind of thing. You, you didn't know anything about what was going on. Um, working in the palm house was also extremely hot. And there, there were these records of, you know, hard work, hard labor. Um, John Smith really hated <laughs> Joseph Hooker and all his scientific newfangled ideas. And, and because he was responsible for having to rearrange everything when Joseph Hooker decided he was going to rearrange the palms and he had to get all his men to listen from A to B. And you know, kind of what was the point of it all is what John Smith usually ended up saying. Um, but he was also really uh, kind of uh, devoted to the, the plants themselves. And what he absolutely hated was when the hookers kind of went pruning in the palm house because, of course, when they <laughs> overgrown and was threatening the glass at the top, they had to cut things down. And, 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 and Smith keeps a diary, a journal, in which he marks as black days, the days that the hookers hookers can go a pruning in the palm house. Really <laughs> well, this is gym stuff. <laughs> Anyway, that's absolutely superb. Thank you so much. If there are no other questions, um, can we thank Kate for a wonderful, uh, wonderfully illustrated, beautifully delivered, um, scintillating, shall I say, talk. But thank you so much. There are lots of comments on the chat thanking you, Kate. Uh, if you want to spend a few minutes looking at that um, and you know all your admirers there. Uh -huh. And we've put your book uh, and where you can buy it on the chat. Um, yes, and we, you know, and we look forward to your next book on the workers. Is that is that <laughs> what you want to be writing about? The, the workers do make their way into it, this one, but yeah, um, yeah. You know, it was it was a huge labour as well. But yeah, thank, thank you, you so much for me, Vanita. It's been like. Yeah, yeah.